So thank you all for coming this afternoon. My name's Jen Copestake. I'm a reporter with the BBC's technology TV program, Click. We're going to be talking today about a what-if scenario. So this is sort of to project, we're actually thinking that this is a scenario where 50% of jobs from today's employment have disappeared. So that's how we're going to try and imagine. I know it's a difficult thing to imagine, especially we've seen some reports this week from the World Economic Forum saying that jobs will be lost to artificial intelligence, but many more jobs will be replaced. So that's something that we're going to discuss in the panel. Like I said, it would be fantastic to get as much audience participation in the discussion as possible. Um, we're going to start with a raise of hands vote, talking about universal basic income. So first of all, is everybody familiar with universal basic income? I'd imagine that's the case, yeah? All familiar? Here, how many people are for the idea of instituting a policy of universal basic income if we did lose 50% of jobs? Raise your hands. Okay, so one, two, three, four. I'd say that's about half and half, maybe? What do you think? 50%? Oh, sorry. <laughs> maybe after well, the discussion, we can figure that out. For universal basic income. 네, 여러분들이 과연 여기서 지금. And how many against? Okay. So significantly fewer. And how many? <coughs> did anybody abstain? They're, they're gonna wait. Yeah. Yeah. Not sure. So the end of the discussion, we'll see if more people think for or against either one. First, I'd like to introduce our panelists. So I have Dr. Hilary Cotton, who's a social entrepreneur from the UK. She's also recently written this excellent book, which I've had the pleasure of reading in early copy, called Radical Help. Um, it's about revolutionizing the welfare state. Um, to my right is Governor Lee Jai Myung. He's a former mayor of Songnam City, where he ran a basic in um, income experiment in the city in Korea. He's now the governor of Jiangji province, which is the most populous province in Korea. <laughs> So thank you for coming. Uh, we have John Hawksworth, who's a chief economist, the chief economist at PwC, and has recently authored a very interesting report on AI and jobs in China, which we'll be discussing. And of course, we have Minister Polson, uh, Trolls Lung Polson is the Minister of Employment from Denmark. So it's fantastic to have you guys all here. Welcome. And Hilary, we'd like to start with you. Each panelist is going to have five minutes to explain how they see this uh, discussion going. Hilary, please. Okay, so I mean, my perspective is historical, which is that every time we have an industrial revolution, we're on the fourth, some people say the fifth, we have a, a huge panic about how jobs are going to disappear. There's the boys, usually it is the boys, cry robot and everybody panics. And actually, this very rarely happens. Uh, however, because we're in a what-if scenario, I'm going to take it as read that we are in a what-if scenario and that it is about losing 50% of tasks, I think, and 5% of jobs. And I think what is very different about this fourth industrial revolution is the speed at which things will change and the collective nature of it. And I think that is true. And so I suppose the question is, if roles are going to change, how are we going to manage this transition? Because I think it's certainly true that with the current forms of support that exist in most countries in the world, the transition is going to be bloody at best. It, it won't work. And we need to kind of reinvent collective forms of support. So I just want to kind of briefly suggest four things that I think we should kind of undertake in this scenario. The first is I think we need to reinvent social and labour institutions quite radically. This is what happened after the Second World War. It's what oiled the wheels of the last industrial production, that we had kind of different financial setups. We had very agile ways of kind of moving what was then, there was a big panic at that time of uh, agrarian migration to the cities in Europe. And we kind of invented the welfare state to kind of ease that transition. And we need to do the same again, but we need to do it in a much more agile way so that people have passports, they can carry different benefits, different skills, they can have kind of different um, uh, forms of kind of uh, moving from one job to the other. Because I think the other thing that's going to happen is it's not going to be a once-off job loss, it's going to be a continual process of transition and change that's going to be part of this industrial revolution. So we need to kind of think about continual change. The second thing I think is really important is that we need to emphasize different soft skills. So I think that um, 
what we're, what's going to matter, what increasingly seems to be the case already, is that it's not so much your hard skills, it's your soft skills. Because even if the work needs hard skills, you can't deploy them without soft skills. By this I mean things like uh, empathy, teamwork. And one of the things I've been doing as a social entrepreneur is I've been inventing a new form of support for people who are out of work, in between work, who can't progress in the modern economy. And what we do is we take apart, we don't ask them what their CV looks like, we take apart their skills and we kind of rearrange it horizontally and we look for those things that are uh, parallel, that can be applied in different ways. And our service costs one-fifth of the standard approaches and is extremely successful in supporting people, often older people actually, whose skills are already redundant, but also young people who have got a mismatch and can't start work. And so I think we could kind of build on ideas like that about thinking very differently. The third thing is I think we need to think about relationships. We shouldn't just think economically. Already, mm. eight out of ten jobs are found through who we know in the modern economy. And it looks like already with the changes that are happening that this is only going to increase. And of course, people who are at some distant from the labour market usually have the weakest and the less diverse social ties. So we need to think not just about slotting people into this production line of work, which was the old economy, but much kind of more cohesively about this as a big collective problem and how we kind of increase the relationships between people. And then fourthly, I want to say that we need to kind of think about data differently. So at the moment, with the exception of this rather great PwC report that WEF has commissioned, we've only got backwards looking data. So we keep counting what's missing and it's very hard to kind of see where the opportunities are opening up. And so we need different forms of data collection that focus on what's happening, what's opening up, and how all of us might connect to it. So I think, uh, I don't actually think there'll be a doomsday scenario. I think it's possible. Um, but I think we have got plausible case for hope, but only if we radically restructure the kind of collective social institutions around us that can help us all transition. It's not an individual or an individual's problem in this next industrial revolution. Do you see a time frame, that, the, the critical time frame that we have? Is this a, a case of five or 10 years, 10 to 20 years? Well, I, I mean, of course, because I don't think it's actually going to happen, and I think the new <laughs> jobs are going to come yeah. along. But I do think, yeah. I think it will be kind of slower than we think. And okay. it will be, and because I think actually what's going to happen is that tasks are going to move rather than jobs are going to disappear. Although, of course, mm -hmm. some jobs are going to disappear. This does give greater flexibility for people. But, but, as, but if we don't, I think what's more important is in a much shorter time frame, we rethink our education systems, which aren't equipping people for kind of constant movement, as some countries are doing in the world, but certainly my country is not that agile at and Europe may have challenges with, and that we also think, as I say, that we, have, we stop trying to kind of fix our out-of-date welfare systems and we kind of radically invent new ones. So I would try and focus the time frame on, on that rather than what's happening with work. And very quickly, your opinion on uh, universal basic income, yes, yes or no? I, I, no. No, okay. <laughs> John Hawksworth. Okay. Can everybody hear okay or do we need to speak louder? Louder. Okay, louder. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so thanks very much. And, and thanks to Hillary for her remarks. And I agree with a lot of what Hillary says about this Probably we won't see this kind of doomsday scenario. Our own analysis suggests that in the UK you might see 20% of jobs displaced over the next 20 years and roughly 20% created, so broadly balanced. Uh, for China, in the report we published yesterday, actually launched with effort, well, not commissioned by them as such, but launched here, um, we, we predicted that yes, more than a quarter of Chinese jobs might be displaced, but actually we think that the likelihood is that even more than that, more than 30% might be created, so the net effect could be positive. Um, having said that, you know, more than a quarter of Chinese jobs is 200 million people right. potentially having to move jobs, move careers, possibly move locations. Yeah. So that is a huge disruption, even if it's not 50%. Secondly, when we break the analysis down by sector, for example, in our UK analysis, we find that in areas like transport and logistics, as autonomous vehicles roll out mm -hmm. across the economy, you know, you could see 50% or more in that sector. In some areas of low-value manufacturing in China or agriculture, you could see that kind of displacement. So in certain sectors, you could see that kind of displacement. And it may be very difficult to reskill people to find jobs within that sector. So they'll have to move to other parts of the economy uh, where we see job growth in healthcare, in education, in technical scientific areas. So I, I think, you know, while it's, it may be a relatively unlikely that 50% of this place, there is going to be big disruption coming. Not immediately. We don't think it will happen over the next few years. I think we've got a window of opportunity of maybe five to ten years mm -hmm. to get ready for this before it really starts to happen on a big scale later in the 2020s and into the 2030s as these technologies mature. Um, so what could we do to try and, if you like, mitigate some of these, these costs if it does get anywhere close to this sort of 50% doomsday scenario? Well, I think one thing you know, is that we do have to start investing seriously in lifelong learning. 
Um, and, you know, I think if you look at countries that we see as being good at this, like Iceland, you know, it has such a higher employment rate than the UK or any other OECD country. New Zealand also very high. I think some of these countries are trying to invest in this seriously, I think, you know, really do act as, as best practice. In the UK, unfortunately, we've actually been investing less in adult education, further education with the austerity we've had over the last eight years. Mm -hmm. And actually, that's been run down. Mm -hmm. And I think in future, we're going to have to think about higher education much differently. Instead of doing three years of university when you're 18, you might do a one-year intensive course when you're 18, another year when you're 38, and the third year when you're 58, as mm -hmm. you have to retrain again. And what kind of subjects do you think people will be studying in that scenario? Well, in... You know, who, who knows, you know, it could be some sort of advanced, you know, genomics or something in, when you're 38 and something out of a science fiction book when you're 58. But so, you know, you have to remain, as Hillary said, agile and, you know, it's just teaching adaptability to children and teaching the ability to, to be adaptable is perhaps as important as teaching them, you know, knowledge that they can, you know, uh, pick up as they go along through their life experience and their work experience. Um, I think another important area is, is actually that I think that you need to look at competition policy. This might not seem obvious, but one of the key ways this technology benefits society is it improves productivity, reduces costs, and therefore allows lower prices. Therefore, consumers have higher real incomes to spend on other things, and as they spend them on other things, things like health, education, other, uh, other areas as well, uh, that can actually then lead to extra jobs and other types of services. And so that's traditionally has been the way of the last 250 years, this price mechanism, that a lot of these benefits have filtered through to the rest of society. Um, and that, so I think if competition doesn't work, then you might actually get these profits being hoarded by sort of monopolists, you know, whether in the technology sector mm. or whether in other sectors. Does so, that worry you? So having an effective competition policy, well, we have seen that concentration ratios that, you know, have increased in economies like the US and the UK recently. It's not just technology, it's also other sectors. Um, to some degree, that's a natural feature of the technologies that some of them have economies of scale and scope that lends themselves to a few people winning, mm. a few winners. But I think you do have to make sure that markets are still contestable so new people can come in and challenge them. And you also have to you know, make sure that they're not sort of being anti-competitive in some way. So I think competition policy to try and make sure that these benefits are passed on to consumers and are spread through society that way is really important. I think a third area is I think you do have to strengthen the social safety net. You know, like Hillary, I wouldn't personally go for the universal basic income in its pure form, although I think it's interesting to see the trials that are going on. But I do think something, for example, like some sort of conditional income support built into current systems that would not just, uh, would not just sort of reward people that are in work on low incomes, but would also perhaps reward people who you know, lost their job and were trying to retrain or were doing something socially useful in terms of looking after grandparents or children or who were volunteering with an approved charity. So somehow contributing to society, I think the idea of some sort of income support for people in that category might be more politically acceptable and might be, be more affordable. So I think you have to sort of rethink to a certain extent the conditionality around these things and try and uh, provide a, a stronger social safety net. And in places like China, I think maybe part of that is also reinvesting the proceeds of this growth, which will boost tax revenues for government mm -hmm. in trying to move towards more of a universal free healthcare, universal free education, and then people actually won't have to you know, spend so much of their income as they do in China at the moment on those things, which mm -hmm. in the UK we might rather mm -hmm. take for granted. So I think there's a range of things you can do. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't personally choose universal bank income, but I think there's some other things you can do to strengthen the social safety net. What I wouldn't do, like I could mention one thing, is put up borders and try and shut out people or trade or ideas. I think that, that might seem like a, a solution to some people in the short term, but in the long term, it's just a recipe for economic stagnation. I mean, it all sounds very utopian so far, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> Universal health care and fantastic education systems. Well, it's something you move to over a period of decades, but yeah. look at the 19th century in the UK and the 20th century. You know, we had the same phenomenon. We had the Industrial Revolution. That produced massive growth, but also massive income inequality. Yes. And Marx was writing about revolutions in 1848 or something. And they, they, they got around that by introducing things like gradually introducing universal free education, the welfare state in the mm. 20th century, things like the NHS in the UK. Mm. So that way you had a sort of social democratic solution that, that narrowed the inequalities. Maybe we're at another sort of political inflection point where you have to start looking at that again. Maybe. I'll come to you, Hilary. I'll just get Mr. Paulson's thoughts. 
What do you think about this? It sounds all very good that we're having quite a nice future with our robotic friends that are going to be helping us get universal health care, fantastic education. Do you see the same situation in Denmark? Yeah, I'm, I'm quite optimistic, I must say. I, in fact, agree quite much with uh, the Could remarks. You speak yes, I agree <laughs> quite much with the remarks from Hillary. Uh, when we look uh, in the history of, of Denmark, uh, going 50 years back, uh, almost 10% of the workforce uh, were employed in the agricultural business. Right now, it's below 2%. And at that time, uh, people also discussed, uh, what about all these uh, persons? Would they have a job in the future? And we have managed, in fact, to create a lot of new jobs. Also jobs, if you go 50 years back, nobody knew should be a job in the future. So, so I'm, uh, I'm quite optimistic, as I was saying in the beginning. But what if, uh, I think we have to work with the vocational training and also lifelong learning. We have seen that in Denmark. That has been uh, quite successful. A year ago, we just managed to make an agreement, a tripartite agreement between the unions, the businesses, and the government. Uh, and the focus for, for that agreement was how to invest in upskilling uh, the workers, and especially people with uh, low skill or, or no skills at all. So I think that's a crucial part of the future that is uh, to invest and also to create opportunities for people that will lose jobs, to create new jobs uh, and also give them some more advanced possibilities than they have today. And universal basic income, is it something that you could see happening in Denmark? No, not, not in the future, but, but we have also, I must say, a quite well-known welfare state system in Denmark. So we have social benefits in Denmark, but I'm, I'm not I in favor of uh, universal basic income. And how come? Because I think it's a failure to give up people. I think we should demand that people are a part of the society. And we have seen in Denmark that our employment rate uh, now is the highest ever. Mm. So that's also uh, a, quite, uh, a, a, a quite unique uh, position. Mm -hmm. That even though we have uh, authorization, robots and that kind of thing, we have the, the story right now in Denmark that uh, we have uh, so many people employed, it's the uh, highest level ever. So, Governor, we've heard three people on our panel saying for universal basic income. <laughs> <laughs> We're discussing beforehand that actually this youth credit that you gave in Songnam, 96% of the people who received it thought it was a very positive thing to have received. Could you tell us about your experience? I'm sure everybody here would love to hear about this. Uh. First of all, I think, well, when you look at our history, well, the world has been changing and it has been revolutionized. Well, once in the UK, well, a long time ago in UK, well, people, well, they actually destroyed the whole equipment, m machinery. But, uh, well, it's inevitable that we are changing, our world is changing, and it's been revolutionized and automated. And then a lot of the countries, they are they try to solve this problem by shortening the labor hour so that and distributing more people to work. But what if uh, in the future, in the near future, if the labor of the 50% of the people lose their job, I think well people would go very violent. So I think we should uh, be well addressed to the problem that human caused. So, well, some in the policy wise, well, some countries they shorten the labor hour, but in some other countries they also come up with uh, the other policies. But when we look at the social changes that uh, our world is changing, it's being automated. So 20 or 30 years from now, the so robots or AI would replace a lot of our work. But I think, I think it should be dealt in a policy-wise, because people have their own individual desires, and then they have they. So and then it's the world is very competitive, and well, in some case, the winners. Well, we say that winners take all. 
So I think that we, in this case, so the, the government should play some initiative. We should uh, balance the things up so that so if the, some people, the minority people, take too much uh, of the wealth, then the government should take the initiative to, well, they have more tax to them, or so that to redistribute the, the, the values or the the revenues to the whole people. So that's why, so well, in this world of forced industrial revolution, I think that universal basic income is an inevitable part of our life. It is an inevitable path that we should go for. So we have seen a lot of welfare policies. And well, well, the welfare policies that we have until now, well, they are kind of like minimized uh, well, safety net. So because we do not offer the universal benefit. So it's like, it's more like selective. So those who are given uh, the um, welfare benefits, well, it's, well, it's sometimes it stigmatizes those people. Oh, because I am poor, because I am not good enough, that's why I am receiving this kind of benefit. So it's, and then, well, for some people, uh, if they receive the, say, subsidies, then, well, for some people, they do not wish to work anymore. So, so if we can provide the entire people the basic income, and then if we levy more tax to those people who earn more money, then, well, then those people who do not pay much tax, then they would work harder. And then also for those who earn a lot of money, but at the same time they receive the basic income, but at, but at the same time they will be levied a lot of tax. So, well, up until now, we have dealt with this, um, the unemployment issue by providing, well, shortening the labor hour. But um, but but if we like shorten the labor hour, and then well in that case, but uh, if well that have that would maybe that would um, let people work and then in somehow increase the productivity. But if we like provide a universal income, then we can well people can spend some of their time well to do to do to reskill themselves to upgrade their skills or to to invest themselves in more cultural aspects and others. So. I think that um, the economy should go virtuous cycle. So what's like what uh, this say like, this capitalist capital world is facing is that I think like, we should the kind of we should use the new revenues re resources and then we try to find out the ways to redistribute them to the entire people. And for some people, and they will, would wonder, why do we have to distribute the, the common wealth or the wealth that uh, some people, well, some people will say that I earn more, then that's why I want to have more. Then why do I have to share this with some poor people? Some people would say something like this. But, but some, when you think about, they look at a lot of the many sectors, there are unearned incomes. So let's say, let's take the example of Alaska. So some people would use the fuel, oil fuel, but that's an unearned income. That's the kind of work, the kind of income does not really come from work. It's just, uh, it's for just from the common property. And also the technology, let's say some a person, there was a one uh, inventor, one person invented something, and then it, uh, the technology has been distributed well, and then it's used by so many people. I think that that kind of thing can also be the common wealth, and also the infrastructure that we all have. And uh, if we get some kind of like, revenues from those like, common wealth, common infrastructure, then, well, if we can levy the tax on them. And also, I think that everyone has owns a right to the common property. When you look at the case of the Alaska Namambia, 
they tested on the uh, the basic income uh, policy, and then the, according to the one report, they say that the, those countries they have seen the reduced unemployment rate and the reduced the poverty rate and etc. So uh, some people may say that um, some wonder that what if we do not if we offer universal in of uh, the basic income, then people would not have to work. Some people will do not find the need to work. But if we just pay them the minimum amount, then well, we can encourage them or motivate them to work. And that because we are just me offering them the minimum basic income, so that well, if they want to earn more, if they want to upgrade their life, then I think they would work more. Well, well, it was not provided to everyone. It actually was an experiment. We uh, offered about so uh, 860 USD. So it's a slightly less than uh, one thousand dollar. It was off. Uh, was offered to the people of 24 years old. So people of all ages across all income brackets and being successful. Mm. Yeah. So because we have limited resources, so we cannot uh, we cannot really uh, offer the universal income. So that but. Uh, in our province, we are trying to increase the amount, and then also the the many. We are trying to expand it to many different um, age groups, and because we have the very uh, limited amount, but uh, with both since, but but based on what I have experienced, uh, well, a lot of people found it very satisfactory, and then it was yeah. Lots of different experiments which you go through in your book. Yes. In, in some of these areas. I, I personally thought that you would be for this kind okay. of experiment, but why are you against it? So can I just say one thing built on before I get to of the, course, on the yeah. earlier, which is that I don't think we should think that the kind of uh, welfare state is going to be expensive, that we're, the future welfare state, the current might be, but of course technology also helps us to deliver services in a completely different way. So right. future health, future so education. So healthcare could be delivered remotely through telepresence. Well, yes, and that we can kind of think about different ways about supporting people with different conditions and so on. So actually technology is a kind of, can be a benefit and we can have much better, cheaper welfare states. It's not just on the negative side. But anyway, to come to, well, one thing I'm realizing from listening to Governor Lee is that the language of universal basic income is being used for many different sure, things. Yeah. So I think the idea of a youth credit is incredibly powerful and, and very interesting. I think that's different from what we call in the UK a universal basic income, which basically means that everybody in the, in the nation will get a benefit. Mm. And even those who are most in favor of a universal basic income policy in the UK who've modeled it show a level of income that would be very low. So there would be no fear of people not working. Everybody would have to work. It would just give you a benefit. So my concern is that... Um, that we cannot have a, a society where we accept that technology will just have winners and losers and we'll give the losers an income. That this is going We're to... We're talking about giving everybody an income. So yes, people, but, but yeah. the thing is, is that everybody will have the income, but those people without jobs will have an income that they can barely survive mm. on because it's so low. But a, a, in the same way as Minister Paulson said, mm. it sort of allows society to think, oh, well, it's fine because we've given people an income. So that's, that's, for me, a very big argument, which is that we need to, you know, after the Second World War, people didn't say, oh, there's going to be winners and losers. They said, look, we're having an industrial revolution. We're going to think about how we build societies and how we build welfare states that spread the gains. And that's what I'm interested in. And I don't think universal basic income will deliver that. But I do think the idea of a youth credit is very interesting. Yeah. But to go to the experiments in my book, for instance, one of them is that I work with families who are dependent on multiple levels of welfare that have up to 73 professionals in their lives. Mm -hmm. and and oh, that, that would be a very good example. Many of those families, of course, are part of illegal economies, so they're earning six times any universal basic income. It's not going to help them. But more importantly for me is that they suffer from multiple disadvantage, health, mental health, violence, abuse. And these are complex problems, which, again, are not going to be solved just by giving those families some kind of income and then mm. pretending it's but all going But solved by away. technology, do you think? Well, 
Uh, one of the things, so if I can give you an example, just very concretely, is that um, when I work ethnographically in British public services, I see that 80% of all the resource available is spent on bureaucracy, is spent on filling out forms and kind of very complex industrial systems. 80%. 80%. Yeah. So what we do is that we kind of um, use technology to actually take all of that burden off frontline workers, which means that the, the sort of admin side takes 20% <coughs> of time, which frees up people to work in a completely different way, lower cost, bringing humans back into the equation, and those families' lives are transformed. They do move out of the welfare state, they move into work, their children flourish, but that's about human relationships and putting in new technology platforms to free up those human relationships. It's not about basic income. Families then earn their own income, stand on their own feet, participate in society, and feel a lot better. So just to clarify, Governor Lee, do you, you've experimented with the youth credit. Could you see a scenario in Korea where you would have a universal basic income where everybody in the state is given a certain amount of money if we see 50% of jobs lost because of uh, advances in technology? Mm. 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 Uh, 50% well, if that really happens, if like 50% of the jobs really lost, then I think, well, the country will be one of the, well, everyone would go crazy and it will be very violent. The we, we have seen situations in London, I know obviously it's not the same situation, but we've seen riots in London. We see, I have to say, there's a, there's a desperate inequality in the UK that surely will only get worse when we have scenarios like this in the future. Mm. If more jobs and more jobs are being automated, do you really think, John, that we're going to have time to reskill people? Well, I think there's certainly no time to be lost. You know, I, I don't think this will happen overnight. You know, at the moment, our employment rate is at a record high. Mm -hmm. Uh, the problem is lack of productivity, not employment. Um, which you know, is what and, I think the governor is saying. Which is precisely yeah. what you want to use these new technologies to boost productivity, because it's only if you can boost productivity that you can increase average earnings levels and, and, and try and make up for the sort of real earning squeeze that we've seen over the last 10 years. So I think this is sort of key to addressing the, the, the problem. I mean, in terms of, yes, it, of course, if you were to have 50% unemployment sort of very quickly, that would that would completely have all sorts of social implications. And I, but I don't think there's, you know, as I say, I think you know that just giving people a basic income wouldn't really solve those. You know, you would need to find some way to to get get people to actually do something. I mean, you know, I think I think what you could, I, I don't think that's going to happen nationally in any conceivable scenario. But let's say it could happen in a certain region, for example. Sure. We've seen examples of this before when yeah. when you've had steel industries, coal industries mm -hmm. breaking down. And there, I think, you know, I think one of the lessons in the 1980s from the UK is that if you just let those market forces to try to revive those communities, it doesn't really work. You know, market forces will not automatically bring in new investment. And the government has to play a sort of facilitating role, working with local business and, and, and others to try to support that. And, mm. you know, there are lots of areas where we need a lot more work done. For example, house building in the UK, we have a huge housing crisis, I think mm. maybe... Uh, and we need hugely more homes to be built. And that's still, I think, well, the some automation possible. It's still to be quite a labor-intensive process. Mm. And actually, it's the secret to making housing more affordable and being to sort of bridge some of the huge wealth inequalities which are, which are linked to this housing crisis. So I think in those sort of areas, you know, there are certain areas where the government can sort of pump prime that kind of activity through some sort of public-private partnership to try to, 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 to work with private house builders to actually build affordable housing and you know it, you, you can also do that in in areas that can help to create create growth so so I, uh, you know similarly with transport infrastructure which in the uk is, is sorely lacking if you compare it to to china now um so i mean i think there is there are ways in which government in that sort of scenario could try to respond uh, if, if unemployment in a particular area went to a high level um but i i think you know one has to sort of you know, put this in the context. And I think that sort of the governor, as he says, mm -hmm. saying that in practice you can't pay universal basic income to everyone. Mm -hmm. They're just not affordable at a level. Well, at I think he said that, it, that it would be necessary if there well, was a 50% uh, but, but I still don't think that they would address the kind of social unrest that you mm -hmm. have just doing that. I think you would have to find some way to, if you like, give people a purpose in life yeah. and give I mean, people this something is, to do. Yeah. And just simply handing out income uh, in a relatively small way 
because if unemployment was that high, then tax revenues would also be collapsing, businesses yeah. would be collapsing, yeah. the government wouldn't have money to hand out in the first place. Well, this know? is the thing. Yeah. And so I think there would be all sorts of other problems. So, but, but if we think of it as a more sort of a, a focused problem in a certain area that you have to deal with, then I think you could try and think about these kind of solutions of focused investment to try to, to pump, pump prime and kickstart economic activity, uh, you know, as well as trying to you know, use government investment as a catalyst to get private investment also to be, be brought into areas that might otherwise be, uh, you know, be depressed. Um, but I think that's more likely to be a localised problem rather than a national problem. I mean, you mentioned what it means to be human. Do you think this sort of scenario would change fundamentally the way that we spend our leisure time or the way that, you know, uh, Hillary, we've discussed this as well. Yeah. Do, you, do you think this is something that we have to think about carefully? Maybe even restructuring our economies, our societies? Well, I think it would be really important to kind of have, as John was suggesting, actually, an education system which is much more flexible and also focuses on, uh, on, on leisure time and how we might use our leisure time. I mean, the, the 21st century welfare state I propose is one built around kind of functional and foundational capabilities. And that's a much broader view of what it means to flourish, which means that we have good work, we have, you know, good lives, but also we do have time, time to care, time to pursue other interests, I think that that would also be important. It would be wonderful if that was delivered. But in my mm. lifetime, there's also been a lot of promises of that that haven't come. But I think it would be really important, actually, to think about how we educate young people to, for, that, that, for mental health and everything else, as well as enjoyment of life, that that's a part, mm. once again, an integrated part of life. I mean, who's paying for all of this, these processes? Is it up to the individual to take initiative and decide that they need to reskill because they see that their job is going, Minister, is this something that the government needs to step in and do? Yeah, I think the government should, uh, should play a role. We have seen that in Denmark. Uh, we have created uh, the Nordic welfare model, you can say. And, and the success of that model is that uh, government, businesses and unions are sitting together also making agreements about the future. That has been a huge success in Denmark for many years, for decades in fact. And I think that will be one answer in the future. Uh, I recall that that's uh, easier to say than to deliver because we have uh, a, a different tradition on how to, to govern. Just looking around in Europe, there's a great, great difference between the northern part of Europe and the southern part of Europe. Mm -hmm. But I think that people will, will demand in the future that politicians would uh, take the necessary decisions also to, do, to create growth and deliver uh, education and lifelong learning. But of course, as, as individual, you, you should also invest in your own life and you should also invest in your own education. That's also a part of the, the future, uh, if I just look 10 or 15 years ahead. Mm. I mean, just out of curiosity in the room, how many people here think, and we'll get to some questions, which is great, how many people here think that their current position is under threat from automation? Is there anybody in this room that thinks that? I mean, I think potentially my job is under threat. <laughs> One, maybe. <laughs> and does any, what about reskilling? Is everybody thinking that they need to reskill and, and invest more in their educations? Hands up. Yeah, so Hillary, yeah. So, yeah, that's interesting. Um, yeah, so we have some questions. Gentlemen in the back here, if we have a microphone. And if you don't mind, sir, saying your name and where you're from. My name is. Uh Kumar, K.S. Kumar, uh, from, from New York. And the question is, uh, basically as per the statistics of uh, the WHO, uh, by 2050, the world's population will be less by 2 billion mm -hmm. people. And uh, most of Europe and most of uh, Japan, for example, and other countries across the world, uh, has an aging population of more than 20%. Uh, 20, 20 yeah which is uh, people above 60 years of age. So I'm saying if you just look at the entire global population as a whole, and uh, this whole thing around 50% jobs being lost, and therefore almost about 30, 40% of people are getting old anyway, yes. and will be out of jobs. Yes. So we'll have just enough people across the world if you look at it. Of course, they may be in the wrong countries. <laughs> but they might be in the wrong countries, globally, that's the key. We'll just have enough <laughs> yeah. people who are, in, are required to do the jobs, these 50% jobs are lost. Yeah, so more movement between countries. Do you yes. Think? Yeah. <laughs> more migration. <laughs> yes, questions over here. Sir? Um, my name is Katsuya Baba from Tokyo. And um, 
I'm, I'm very impressed by the optimism yes. of the board, uh, <laughs> of the people here, because uh, what I see in Japan is, well, it used to be seen as a very equal society. The, the difference between the rich and poor is definitely you can, you know, taking place mm -hmm. in a very significant manner. And uh, there are people, the good jobs are getting less, and there's a huge demand for the jobs they, you know, people don't want to do, like construction jobs, mm -hmm. huge mm -hmm. demand, but less. It's mm -hmm. three more jobs per demand, mm -hmm. and uh, applicants, for mm -hmm. example. And uh, more jobs for the long distance uh, drivers, yes. and the uh, nursing, and all you know, people care. Mm -hmm. and those are the jobs that are required, but it's not, you know. It's a cheap job at yes. the same time in some cases. And I, I just wonder how, and also I've been feeling that it is very difficult to avoid competition yes. um, and taking place. And just as you mentioned, and uh, we have more and more winners taking more yes. and hard to tax, how to get them redistribute. And uh, so I just feeling that it is not quite easy for us to imagine that, although the good measures for the retraining will yes. be taking place, but it takes time and people are not good at uh, you know, emotional jobs if they are pretty much geek and yes. uh, doing games, for example. Yeah, well, exactly. I mean, do you think... <laughs> people can change themselves too quick. Do you think there's a difference in the viewpoints between people coming from maybe Japan or Korea where there's huge uh, technology industries compared to maybe some European countries. Do you think there's some kind of disconnect between the points of view, the, the optimism from Europe and maybe more <coughs> realism from Japan well, or, or I, Korea? I, I can't be simplistic like that mm. because um, I'm based on my observation and yep. my view could be limited. But uh, I have a more pessimistic yes. feeling mm -hmm. and which mm -hmm. I can't you know, have quite good answer yet. Yes, interesting. I'll, um, I could take that around if you want. This lady at the back there. Oh, both of you ladies, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, Hello. get you after. You know, after having worked in, as a doctor in the United States for 20 years, yeah. during the recession, a lot of my patients lost their jobs. And the problem is once they lose jobs and start collecting welfare, they become very comfortable. Yes. And it actually becomes very demotivating for the people that are still working. And when you say these jobs are going to be lost, I don't think it's going to be overnight. It's going to be slow. And I think it's really important uh, uh, as a society to look at uh, what the upward mobility jobs are going to be mm. and to you know, look at our education system critically and prepare people and bring in the type of jobs uh, that will allow them to continue working. Mm. Otherwise, you know, what's happiness? You know, not working, just collecting money. And, uh... mm. <coughs> yes, that's a good point. This lady here, Nadine. Um, Nadine Kuzam from Brussels, Global Shaper. Um, so actually I had a question. I more would like to ask an, for an opinion uh, to all the speakers, because we've talked about the, um, uh, income, um, but the WEF was, uh, has been working on a, with a group on a topic of universal rights to learn. Uh, so this idea of giving uh, tokens to people so that they could uh, take time off of their work later in their career mm -hmm. and work. Uh, oh, yeah, sorry, and learn. Uh, so I wanted to have an opinion on what do you think as that as an alternative. Great. I might take, actually, what time is it? I don't have a watch. 15 minutes. What I might do is just take a few more questions and make some notes, and then we'll put those questions to the panel. So yes, uh, one more. This gentleman had his hand up, and then I'm just going to stand here and see who's got uh, their hands up. <laughs> hello. My name is Dani. I'm from Turkey. Um, I have a more optimistic but uh, totally radical uh, idea on that matter. Uh, I believe we um, value a life of human by the uh, job that they complete and money they earn. Mm -hmm. And I believe that in midterm future it will change to uh, what that human finds meaningful and how they fulfill their uh, meaning making. Mm -hmm. And that change will uh, come with the idea that not everyone wants to make money and uh, if not everyone wants to make money we can contribute uh, with values to community and not everyone uh, if we have a very healthy community in maybe a 
much more distant future, not only when we lose half of the jobs, yes. but when we have a new mindset that we can contribute not, <coughs> not only by completing tasks, as uh, panelists stated, but also by giving back in some other way. So in that community, I believe, uh, standard income will be a great solution yeah. for everyone to yeah. contribute in the way that they want to contribute. So we may fundamentally change how we view roles in society. I'm just going to come around. <laughs> yes? Hi, I'm Poshan Lo. Uh, I'm with the Young Scientists group over here at the WEF, and I'm a mathematician at Carnegie Mellon University. Wow. So I actually want to do a mathematical calculation, which is that <laughs> if you take the global GDP of the entire world and you divide it by the number of people in the entire world, the answer is approximately 10,000 US dollars okay. per capita. Most of us would consider in yearly. yearly. The annual <laughs> per capita income per person on Earth. Per, mm -hmm. if, you take D, if you just take GDP, divide by human population, the answer is approximately 10,000 US dollars. So now, when we're talking about social safety nets, actually I want to ask a very hard question, which is in some sense, almost all the people in this room are the haves, yes. because most of us live in countries for which $10,000 per person per year would be kind of difficult to get a flat in London. Very difficult. So now what I'm asking is, of all of these social safety nets, to what extent do we have a responsibility to use our wealth to expand that, to extend that to the billions of people who are not in this room? Great, thank you. This is a question about responsibility. Just two more questions over here. Yes, this lady. Or three more, sorry. Also, Global Shaper from Los Angeles. Uh, I had a quick question regarding the universal income, actually. Uh, instead of uh, focusing on the problem um, uh, and the solution of what's going on, I actually thought it, it would be interesting to hear your thoughts on uh, completely redoing the current education system because the education system is old and broken and there's lack of adaptability quotient and curiosity quotient that is being incorporated in current education system. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to address this question specifically to um, Governor Lee, to the governor, yeah. because the, the suicide rate in South Korea is mm -hmm. extremely high. Yeah. And the fact that universal basic income rolled out in South Korea has reduced the number of suicide, I'm really curious to see how the government is going to intervene in specifically Korean education, which is extremely uh, uh, specifically focused on skills and academic focus, and how the government could actually intervene in changing that bureaucracy and system. Great, thank you. And we'll put that to the governor and then this gentleman. Hi, I'm Tejun, I'm from Japan, um, uh, but I'm doing microfinancing for countries. Um, the, the point I would like to um, ask you is a uh, corporate social responsibility. Because the, the job is not gone like magic. Um, it is the result of our collective decision to cut the job. And I think many of the people sitting in this room are the business leaders, like mm -hmm. me. Um, so um, I think the, now we may need to de redefine the role of corporations. Yeah. Uh, I personally feel like um, one of the most important social responsibilities for corporations is to maintain the job. So I would like to hear your voice. Thank Great, you. thank you. And one more question at the back here, and then we'll have to bring it back to the panel. Um, hi, I'm Adit. I'm from New York. Um, my question is also about the quality of jobs that the 50% that would have. Currently, wages aren't growing, and there has been a new influx of uh, jobs where there's less security, zero-hour contracts, gig economy jobs. Yeah. So I just wanted to know what the panel thought about the actual quality of the jobs that people are going to have in the future. Yeah, I'm good kind of worried. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so <laughs> quite a lot there. Um, so what humans will find meaningful, we have also ideas about universal education tokens, there's some pessimism in the audience, which is quite interesting, I think it might reflect the vote at the beginning, which was quite high for universal basic income compared to the panel, uh, the responsibility of the haves, which I suppose reflects most of us in the room, the gentleman's question, um, redoing the whole education system, we've got the question from Korea, and also the quality of jobs. So where should we start? Governor, would you start with the question about the Korean education system? Well, you asked uh, two questions. One was the universal, the income, basic income. Um, also about universal basic income. Well, it's, uh, 
well, it's well as I mentioned earlier, uh, is we are still in the experimental the process, but when so we cannot we do not know the outcome yet. But when you look at the Alaska's uh, the case that um, if we do initiate the basic income policy, then uh, well, the it somehow stabilized the the people's well-being and then so and that it's since it uh, changes the people's mindset and that it would somehow uh, the reduce the suicide rate and the Korea uh, well we do have some like ineffective like policy so uh, in terms of the policy and also education i think we need to do a lot of the resurfacing redesigning the universal aka kyoyuk could you explain again um nadine sorry you were talking about the universal education token Can you hear me? Yep. The idea was instead of having um, universal basic income is to have oh, okay, uh, yeah. tokens on education so that you could uh, perpetually continue learning and taking mm -hmm. time off of your work for that. Do you think that would be useful? No. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think what well, they can be one part of the welfare, the policy, because when we say the, the welfare, then, well, that's that one thing very important is that we want to, we need to educate or training, train those individuals so that they fit the labor market, so that they reskill themselves to follow the trend of the future. I think it is very important. So I think that's very, one of the very good uh, welfare policy. Jobs. Would somebody like to answer what they see as the quality of the jobs that the 50% would have in the future? I mean, I think that this is more of a concern to me than the number of jobs, really. Yeah. I mean, I think the number of jobs, I feel jobs will be created, but the, it's linked to the point about income inequality. You know, the danger is you get what in UK we might call an upstairs, downstairs society, where you have an elite who are very wealthy, and then we go back to the sort of you know, environment that we used to have in the 18th, 19th century, where you have a lot of sort of people almost like you know, paid servants yes. for the elite doing their gardening and looking yeah. after their pets and, yeah. you know, Maybe not driving them because they'd have driverless cars, but you know, doing other kinds of household services and personal services. And so we get a sort of a two-tier society, rather like we used to have in the UK yeah. before the First World War. So do the people sitting in this room have a responsibility? Well, I, I think there's certain issues. I mean, going back to the point on corporate social responsibility, certainly in PwC, the people are allowed to take a certain number of days off to work for charities, to work on a pro bono basis on some sort of social enterprise thing, or or to do other things, and people are encouraged to do that, and that's seen as a positive thing when it comes to year-end assessments. And we also you know, try to encourage social mobility, you know, both through working with young people in particular described areas, uh, inner city areas, but also through trying to take on more people as uh, school leavers without graduate degrees than perhaps we used to do, uh, offering more sort of professional apprenticeships for people who perhaps you know, haven't had the family background and so that makes it easier to go to university, but may still have the capabilities to be very successful in their career. So, yes, I think, uh, you know, both companies and, and individuals have responsibility. Um, but ultimately, you know, there's a limit to how far that will solve the problem if the government doesn't provide the overall framework that sort of pushes people in that direction. Uh, I think as far as retraining is concerned also, I think companies, you know, in some areas have a responsibility for retraining you know, where they can just sort of reskill someone. So the truck driver who's replaced by a driverless vehicle, you know, maybe he could get a job repairing that vehicle, maybe he could sit in a control room, you know, mm. acting like an air traffic controller. But some people, you know, won't, there won't be enough of those jobs to totally replace That's all the, the truck yeah. drivers gone. Yeah. So maybe you need to have, you know, therefore at that point, you, you can't just put it on an individual company. Yeah. And it may be that there's some sort of industry sector solution in some cases yeah. where industry sector as a whole, you know, But what, what about the gentleman's idea from, from Turkey? He was saying that basically we need to make more meaningful jobs or vocate, uh, free time. Maybe well, we mean, have to fundamentally think, reorganize society. I, mean, I think that would be great. But, you know, it sort of reminds me of what Keynes sort of said in about 1930s where he said, you know, 
we're going to be eight times richer in a hundred years' time, and we'll have to therefore work a lot less. And he was about right about being eight times richer in GDP per capita. That's pro but 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 we we work less until the, yeah. the late seventies, and then mm -hmm. since then in the UK. We seem to have been working more, particularly actually better off people seem to have been working more. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, somehow we've lost that sort of life of leisure that seemed to be, you know, on the horizon when I was a teenager and yeah. somehow we're, we're all working even harder. So maybe yeah. we need someone to sort of switch us away from this workaholic mentality. Yeah. Uh, but it seems, to, uh, it seems to afflict the better off people uh, uh, as, as much as anyone. So I, how, how you switch that, I don't know, you know, have yeah. compulsory Buddhism as a religion yeah. or something, I don't know, but it's... A, it, 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 that really does take you into a more utopian area, maybe. Hilary? Well, I want to answer all the questions. They were so great, and I know there's not time. Yeah. Um, I think that one of the things is that, you know, from a historical perspective, is that the reason that kind of new forms of organisation were created after the Second World War was because otherwise the Industrial Revolution would misfire. So to the question here about yeah. mathematics, I mean, I think that if we don't create consumers for the next Industrial Revolution, yeah. that, you know, it's not just altruism. We really, really need to think about how we link uh, jobs... Um, and, and so that's why I'm kind of very taken with the Danish idea of, you yes. know, modern forms of union. They're not adversarial. They give a role to corporations that are way beyond people giving just a few days of their time, which mm. is just a not enough. They think about how, in a kind of multi-stakeholder way, we genuinely do work to kind of ease this transition. But maybe I can um, talk about the, oh, the optimism question, since I, yes. I am one of the optimists Absolutely. on the panel. Perhaps yeah. I should address that. <laughs> well, no, I just want to say that ageing is great, because that's a whole new care economy that, again, is kind of new work. That could also be taken over by robots. We've seen that, well, um, no, because click. empathy <laughs> people don't want robots, but that will be a question about income as whether you get a human yeah. or a robot, but that's yeah. nothing. But I think about optimism is, look, I... I I think that this is, we are facing a, a dramatic choice. And the reason that I kind of work on welfare reform and I've written the book is because I think we are at a moment of, of decision, really. And so it's not that I kind of assume that everything is going to be okay, far from it. But I do think we do actually have a choice and we do actually have the possibility to build new forms of institution, new cultures, new ways of working that can support from where we are now into a better future, that can spread the gains because actually the possibility of future technology for us in our lives are immense for rich lives if we kind of think about how we do it. So I think we have an actual choice and we have to grasp that choice and work on it. Thank you. Minister, how do you feel after hearing the questions from the audience? Is it a little bit more pessimistic or optimistic still? No, I'm still <laughs> optimistic, but uh, I'll, yeah. I'll say it's very diff difficult questions. Very difficult. Yeah, yeah. And it respects also or reflects, uh, I think... Uh, where people have, has, has their home and grown up because uh, we have different societies around the world. I think that that's also necessary to say here in this discussion. In Denmark, it's for free to take a, a university degree. Uh, you, ha you don't have to pay for that. Mm. And in other parts of the world, you have to pay a lot of that. Yeah. And, and that's, uh, that's a great uh, obstacle for, for many people if they don't have the money to go to university. Mm. But, but that's also the model that you have created. Mm. So it depends on the politicians that are in, mm. uh, in government in, in your country. Yeah. Because even in the European Union, there's a great difference between the countries. Absolutely. And, and then going around in the world, uh, I, I don't think we can fix that uh, here today. No, uh, sadly. Uh, <laughs> I think we, we have, have, had, have yeah. to have more time to, to, to deal to with that. But, but I, I think... Uh, that the future would, uh, would give us m more possibilities than the past. I think uh, technology would, would give uh, more uh, growth around in the world, and I think uh, that we should, uh, of course, discuss how to spend these, uh, these, uh, these growth issues, or how, how, to de how to define the money that has been uh, given to people who should then uh, have uh, different benefits? And, and that's, that's a crucial question. Great. And I think, um, so we're running out of time now. We're just wrapping up. Show of hands, after hearing the panelists discuss this, are you for a universal basic income now? Yes or no? Yes first. OK. <laughs> yes, OK. And no? One, two, OK. I think you got a few more no's, yeah. And any, any abstentions still undecided? Still undecided. Okay, well, thank you guys so much for listening and joining in the discussion. Thank you to the panel.